you know what I thought would be funny? What? What if, because you know how I, uh, I edit all these in Pro Tools. I do, I do know how you edit, yeah. What if I just started like adding effects to your voice and you didn't know? <laughs> how would you take that? Um, I think I would laugh. I mean, that's the about that sometimes when I watch like YouTubers who have editors. Mm-hmm. And then they just get absolutely played. You wouldn't get mad? Out. No, I would laugh. What if you just found out that something happened to you like in post, you know, yeah. after we're listening back to it, like yeah. you're listening to it on Spotify and yeah. you're just like, oh snap. I changed my rating on Spotify to four stars. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well then maybe I won't. No, we would on. giggle. I would giggle. All and right. then we would come in the next time to record and I'd be like, count your days. <laughs> Welcome to TikTok Theology, a podcast that tackles the major trending topics on social media that concern the Christian faith. I'm Megan. And I'm Steven. We know you can't form a theology in three minutes or less, but those videos can identify current issues. TikTok will give us the prompt and then we'll do a deep dive. Thanks for joining us in this exploration. Hello, friends. Welcome back. Uh, two days ago was one of our, you know, favorite holidays. Yes. <laughs> she says sarcastically, sort of. Um, it was St. Patrick's Day. Yep. And Megan is pretty Irish. Pretty Irish. Irish. She said that Ish. earlier and I yeah. felt like that deserved to be on here. It did. It did. It did. And so um, I've been to Ireland. It was beautiful. I loved it. Um, Dublin, you blend right in? Double, I, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I, I think I did. People were just like assuming you were Irish? You know, I didn't open my mouth a lot because it's like I didn't have a lot of talking to do and I was just minding my business. Mm-hmm. So I feel like if I if they never heard me speak, like, I don't know. I feel like I could have blended in just fine. There you go. But who knows? Yeah. Uh, me and all the sheep. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I ambiguously blend into like basically every European country. Yeah, just kind of yeah. plopped. Like, I'm like, okay, maybe. Half Puerto Ricans, half Germans mixed look like everything. You're like, it's, it, it could be, I could, I could be, be Portuguese, anywhere. I could yeah, be Spaniard, like, I could be French, <laughs> I could be German, like whatever, like it, anything. So. It's exciting. So two days ago, I hope you pinched somebody who wasn't wearing green. Mm-hmm. I hope you wore your shamrock shades mm-hmm. and your green beads. <laughs> and I hope you had a good time. Um, but we, uh, it, it, St. Patrick's Day is a little bit relevant to our uh, conversation today. It is, it is. So um, in the 400s, our good man, St. Patrick, <laughs> was, um, honestly, he was a pre-European, like pre, pre-Europe pre thinker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was so early on. He was one of the, fa- like, really like a church father who set a lot of precedent in, in a lot of different conversations, and especially to one that we're going to be having today regarding the Trinity. Yeah. I thought, yeah, this is really apropos when we were doing our pre season two research and mm-hmm. thinking about topics. Uh, you said there's a lot of stuff on social media about people asking about the Trinity and talking yeah. about it. And then um, when we were looking at when it was going, it was like, oh, snap. Come on. Let's talk about the Trinity around St. Patrick's Day. That's so perfect. Because St. Patrick in the uh, the three leaf clover. Yeah. He used it as an example. As a, as a good old a, a good old sermon illustration. It's See? one clover and three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Look at that. I mean, sermon illustrations have been around since forever, and that's just a fave one. So if you, find, one. if you find a good old three leaf clover, St. Patrick. <laughs> just remember and think of the Trinity in this moment. <laughs> there you go. Hey, can you, can you talk a little bit why um, Gen Z cares about it? Like, why is it a trending topic? Yeah. So honestly, I mean, social media and we, we've chatted about deconstruction before and in the age of really kind of questioning all the things Mm -hmm. that we think of and that we relate to. And in Christianity, I think something that's so hard even for Christians to articulate is the concept of the Trinity. Yeah. It's one of the hardest things that even as someone who has loved the Lord her whole life, gone to Bible college, has a master's degree, like it's still such a difficult conversation to have um, with believers and non-believers. Like it's so it's so difficult to really kind of try and wrap your head around stuff. Yeah. Um, so I think that I've seen several times, many a time on social media, this conversation of like, Oh, well, Christians aren't even really worshiping one God because there's three mm-hmm. and like a whole, you know, yeah. Oh, you don't even fully understand like what Christians mean because clearly they worship three gods, not just one. Yeah. It's, and, it's an attack we'll get from um, Muslims too, Muslim yeah. theology. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's a conversation of like, whether or not, you know, you can fully believe it in your whole heart of hearts, and it, but it is such a hard conversation to have. And mm-hmm. if you ever find yourself in a, in a space where someone says that to you or you see that, we want to be someone who can, some, a resource that can help equip you to have this conversation. Yeah, how to talk about the Trinity. <laughs> how to talk about the Trinity and the fact that the three-in-one type conversation, the three-leaf clover sermon illustration. And so yeah, that's yeah. kind of what we're going to dig into today. Okay, great. 
So let me go ahead and start this conversation by answering what does the Trinity mean? And so um, very basically, the Trinity is a, a way to understand God. And the formula used to understand God is that God is one in essence and three persons. Now, essentially where that came out of is through the biblical affirmation that not only is the father God, Mm -hmm. but we believe Jesus is God Mm -hmm. and we believe the Holy Spirit is God. Mm -hmm. And we believe that they are all God co-eternally, that one didn't come before the other, that, um, that Jesus being the son of God doesn't mean he came afterwards, but he's the eternal son. So he was always there. And that's literally kind of the language that early church leaders, Athanasius and Arius had like a fight against. It's like, yeah. like doesn't sonship mean that he came after? It was like, no, he's eternal. So he's always there. And this is metaphorical language to talk about a relationship that God has right. within God's self. So that's essentially um, the issue. So I think a good way to describe it is first, let's look at um, some of the scriptures and then how it kind of came about. Yeah. Okay. Great. And then once we get that, like, we'll think about what are some ways to explain it. And, and yeah, whatnot. we'll lay some scriptural foundation and then we'll dig into some nuance. Right. Here. So some people will say that the first instance of the Trinity is right there in Genesis. Yeah. And so you have Genesis one twenty six, um, where there's God spoken about in plurality. Let us make man in our image. And then there's also in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So that's the father as creator, right? Yeah. And then God said, and so you see the word being spoken, yeah. uh, everything being spoken into creation yeah. is through the word. And then the spirit of God hovered, hovered over, over the, the waters. chaotic waters. Mm-hmm. So we see that now the old Testament probably didn't have a sense of God being Trinitarian. And that's, that's just the truth of right. it. This is a, an idea that developed, um, you know, through the ages and through how, how scripture kind of was, re- was revealed and opened up. But by the time it came to the new Testament, these ideas were fleshed out. Right. So for instance, why would we think that God said like that being the word would be associated as the second person? Well, very specifically is because John one right. completely echoes Genesis one. Mm-hmm. It even starts with in the beginning and the word became flesh. Right. And we're it's, like, who's the word? Right. Jesus is and the word. And it says Jesus is the word the, yeah. uh, I mean, who lived among us. Right. It says in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Mm-hmm. It was through him that all things were created yeah. and nothing was created apart from him. Yeah. So like this, passage right there associates completely the word of God as the power by which all things were created. Mm -hmm. So you have father creating through the word, Mm -hmm. but that right there, we read back into Genesis one, even though the old Testament writers might not have done that. Right now, typically that's a really bad hermeneutical principle to do to read (laughs) things backwards. Right. Right. But the only reason we would do that and especially when we're talking about Trinity and the reason why the Bible is like, like Christians are super affirmed in doing this Mm -hmm is because Jesus isn't just some dude. Right. We believe Jesus is the incarnate God, is God made flesh. And so with that, reading the Old Testament back in light of Jesus, in light of the incarnation itself is appropriate Mm -hmm. because Jesus himself said, all the laws and the prophets were written about me. Yeah. So we should read Christ back into those texts, but we shouldn't read ourselves backwards into the text. That'll be eisegesis. You know what I mean? It's a great differentiation. Yeah. So yeah. like, so really the only people who could do that were the <laughs> new Testament writers when they're thinking about the lens of Jesus. So right. when Paul is mentioning passages and he's saying Jesus fulfilled them, or when Peter, you know, stands up and says, Joel two is happening right now in acts two. And, and he's, and he's putting that on Jesus. Yeah. Like that's, they're reading back into those things. They're showing the fulfillment of it, but they have the right to do so because of the incarnate Christ. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of like the first little, little caveat there. And so when we read in Genesis one, the Trinity, it is a very Christian interpretation of Genesis one, mm-hmm. but I would also argue it's a very appropriate uh, interpretation of Genesis one yeah. given the incarnate Christ. Right. So that being said, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the new Testament that speaks towards it too. So we <laughs> have second Corinthians 13, 14, the way uh, Paul would end his letters. He says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy spirit be with you all. And so he's mentioning clearly the father, son, and Holy spirit right there in, right. in this letter. So that means at least the church in Corinth was using Trinitarian language to understand God. Yeah. Um, and then you have Matthew 28, 18 through 19. This is about Jesus, right? Yeah. And says, 
And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the father and the son and of the Holy spirit. Yeah. And so this is a famously the great commission mm-hmm. and it's using Trinitarian language that we're supposed to baptize in all three persons names, right? Yeah. We have um, John one, which we talked about the word was with God and the word was God. Um, and then uh, later on in John one, like right there, it says very explicitly from verse 14, it says, and the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, this was of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only son, who is close to the father's heart, who has made him known. And so that passage, you have John explicitly stating that the word is Jesus. And in the beginning of it, it said that the word was God. In the beginning was the word and the word was God, right? And so you have all of the, so Jesus is unequivocally called God by John, also Hebrews one, um, and, and these passages, and these are passages that like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses actually will struggle with mm. because they see Jesus as subordinate to the father right. coming after. Mm-hmm. And so Jehovah's Witnesses will actually change those words in scripture. Oop. Yeah, they will. John one and Hebrews one. <laughs> so if you actually take the Greek lexicon and look at a, the Bible that the Jehovah's Witnesses are using, they're different translations. They, they actually change it. And then Mormons will um, understand it through the Book of Mormon. So they'll like use the Book of Mormon sure. as, an, as, as a hermeneutical tool to understand those passages. Right. And so you also have Matthew three where Jesus is baptized. And then in his baptism, you have the heavens open up, you have the Holy Spirit descending as a dove. Yeah. And then you have the father speaking of this is my son. And so you have um, all three persons of the Trinity right there present, interacting yeah. present. Um, you also have the transfiguration mm-hmm. where um, the God is speaking, you know what I'm saying? And there's this like heavenly opening, op- opening up. Um, so there's a lot of passages there, but there isn't anywhere in the Bible where it's just like, by the way, God is Trinity. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and this is how you describe it. Like, yeah. so, so it's a word that was um, added on later on to describe a reality. So basically the early church fathers were trying to figure out, okay, this is the reality that we see present in scripture, how can, we, is there a way to, to understand it and describe it? Yeah. First person to really talk about it was uh, Tertullian in the second century, around 150, 160 AD. And, and he explicitly defined the Trinity as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And um, so, but then people were using Trinitarian language, but it wasn't until the Council of Nicaea that it was kind of like established. Yeah. And the reason why that happened was after Constantine came to power, he signed the Edict of Milan, And in it, he legalized Christianity. And so Christians for the first time were not being persecuted. So for the first 300 years, you saw like Christians being persecuted like crazy. All those stories we hear about them being fed to lions and being made as human torches, you know, that that took place there in the Roman empire. Right. So now Constantine is in power. He legalized Christianity and he shortly institutes it as kind of the state religion, um, which comes with its own problems and stuff like that for sure. (laughs) But in it, he realized, oh, there's not, there's a lot of variance in what Christians are actually teaching. Right. And we need to have like a a unified confession of what our faith actually means. Mm -hmm. And so he called a council in Nicaea. That's why it's called the council of Nicaea. He got (laughs) all the great bishops from all over the place. And in that time, Northern Africa was some major hubs, Alexandria and, um, and then also in the middle East and then, um, Southern parts of Europe, they had like, you know, major churches and they all, um, you know, came together in Nicaea and they basically hashed out how they would understand, um, a lot of stuff about the doctrines. And what we got from it was the Nicene creed. Also Santa Claus was in here. St. Nicholas was present. A good man. And he uh, slapped a heretic. True story. Y'all go look that up. Santa slapped a heretic. At the Council of Nicaea. At the Council of Nicaea. And y'all can quote me on it. (laughs) (laughs) So um, anyways, at the Council of Nicaea is where they first like had the official Trinitarian language of how to understand Mm -hmm. the reality that's in scripture. Like it's there but like now we have words for it. This three in one, this three in one kind of mentality. And And so, yeah. So they, what they actually came up with is that God is one usia, which is like substance or essence and three hypostases, which is persons. So one in essence, three persons, one usia, three hypostases. And one way I like to think about it 
one of my professors in my undergrad told me this. It's like, if you think about person or persona or in the Greek prosopone, mm -hmm. the meaning is way of being. Like the meaning of person means like way of being. Yeah. Like your way of being, existence, is as a person. It's a personal way of being. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it in that way, you could say God is one in essence and there's three ways of being God all at once, co-eternally, co-extensively. Yeah. That I think is pretty helpful. One God in essence, three ways of being God all at once. Yeah. And nothing is actually Trinitarian besides God. God is the only being in the universe that is properly Trinitarian. Like we might have three parts, like people will be like, humans are like trini Trinities, you know, we have uh, <laughs> uh, mind, body, and soul, but like doesn't, but right. our mind, our body, and soul. They are don't not, exist outside of each other. Really. Right. They're not full on three persons, three ways of being. Right. Right. They're just they're like components of our, of our human constitution. Yeah. Whereas, whereas the Trinity is not talking about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three parts of God. That's actually yeah. heresy. You know what I'm saying? It's not saying like- They're not like aspects. Right. Mm -hmm. One like kind of cruel thing I do in my classes sometimes. <laughs> I'm like, hey, can you describe to me the Trinity? Oh no, it's awful. And then whenever they do- It's so mean. They start giving like examples. The Trinity is like the H2O. Yeah, there's three <laughs> stages of water. Then, and and, and I'm always, whenever they say it, like I'm like, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. Heresy! And I just yell at them, heresy! And they're like, what? And then I explain to them why it's heresy. Yeah. It's usually some kind of modalism or tritheism or yeah. something that is actually heretical because, and, and here's the thing, they could literally say, literally, the Trinity is like, and I could yell heresy right there. Yeah, because it's not like anything else. It's not like anything else. Yeah, nothing else, so, is, so nothing no else is Trinitarian. Yeah, no matter what they say, it's going to be heresy no matter what. The Trinity is like, no. Like heresy. What if he's like, no. And cause think about the way an analogy works. I would cry if I was in a class and <laughs> no, that happened to I, me. I, I made it funny. I didn't, I didn't. It was a joke. Yeah. Like it was like, a silly little joke. They were, they were all no one chuckling cried. when I was yelling heresy. I wasn't, go. I wasn't like trying to be mean or Too anything serious? like that. Too serious. Yeah. No, no, no. And everyone's I, just weeping. Yeah. Like yeah. don't take Steven's <laughs> like, class. He's going to yell at you yeah. and call you a heretic in front of everyone. I mean, that is true, but I did it in, in full jest. jest. <laughs> right. So, um, no. And the reason why is the way analogies work is in order to be an analogy, they're comparisons. they're comparisons, but they're supposed to be qualitatively the same. The relationship is supposed to be qualitatively the same, but on mm -hmm. different scales. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing that has the quality of Trinity at all. Well, I think that's why Christians and even me and all, all of the, everybody, especially if Christians have a hard time with it, you know, non-Christians do as well Is this mm -hmm. like, it's so unlike anything else. Yeah. And so there's such like a degree of faith. There's such a degree of like trust and in, in this thing that so goes far beyond outside of like human understanding and perspective, because we can't fathom being right more than the one like that's so not how we are built. That's why my brain kind of blows up every time they're like, God um, exists outside of time. And you're like, Gah. it's a theological like, proposition. Yeah, because like we're inside. We're so inside of time. We just literally can't even fathom like my brain hurts, like right. thinking being outside, like never right. existing and ne like never starting, never ending. Right. And so I feel like that's why these conversations can be so difficult because it's like this is such a difficult concept because it's so unlike it, we can't, we don't have a comparison point. Now that you say that, I think that brings up an interesting Trinitarian point right here. Oh yeah. You say God is outside of time, but is he? <laughs> Wasn't Jesus one of us? Well, yes. So he was in time cause he's God. Cause he's God. Isn't the spirit in every time? Well, yeah, but Aha! I mean, in the concept of what he never began in the sense of like, there's he's no eternity. beginning and no ending kind of peace is like the fact that right. humans cannot fathom eternity like that right. or existence right, like right, that. Right, right, Cause right. everything we know is mm -hmm. a beginning and an end. Cause that's yeah. how we work. And that's also the beauty of the Trinity is because if you think about what the consequences of this are, mm -hmm. it makes God so much bigger than anything we could actually fathom. Oh yeah. So think about this. So God in his essence, is outside of time and space necessarily so because he's creator, right? He created time and space the construct that he made. Yeah. <laughs> he's outside of that, right? Yeah. Yet he became part of his own creation in yeah. Christ. Mm -hmm. He took on flesh. So while he is outside of time and space, he subsequently and correspondingly became part of his own time and space. Mm -hmm. So he's outside of time and space and inside time and space. And then the <laughs> spirit Augustine calls the bond of love between the father and the son. He's in every time and every space. Yeah. So in God, you have a God who is in a specific time, specific place. Mm. In every time, in every place. 
and outside of all time and outside of all space. So it's a covering for us in every in every single way. situation. <laughs> yeah, and and much more than we could ever imagine. People's concepts of God are usually way too limited. Yeah, we think of God as like a temporal being that's just like bigger than us. Yeah, like just somewhere up in heaven. Mm-hmm. Or we think of God as just truly eternal, but like untouchable. We can't we can't pray to him. We can't change his mind. Whatever. Right. But that's also wrong because he's imminent and he's with us. Yeah. So this is a way that God is like to Trinity is the ultimate way to have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like God is all these things mm-hmm. all at once. We can see him face to face in Christ. Yeah. Yet we can't know God face to face in his eternity but we can in Christ. I think it's an interesting like to come at it from that direction. Cause I think sometimes the Trini- Trinity feels like so theological and it's like something that we just kind of know. Mm-hmm. And even I sometimes don't think about how I directly like relate to a triune God yeah. where it's like, Oh, because I Jesus and because of the Holy spirit, like I have a connection to mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. God, like the, how they inner work. It becomes such like a, a personal thing that I right, feel like sometimes right, right. we don't think of the Trinity as necessarily influential for our lives. Cause we're like, Oh, well God's three in one. Like that's a theological truth. We have to hold to that, but to view it in the, in a way that's such like a personal reality, it's like, I'm only able to it's interact right, with yeah. the creator mm-hmm. of everything because of Jesus Christ. and because of the Holy spirit. Like yeah. that's a really interesting, really cool way. I think to think of the Trinity in, in the, in a different way. That's why it's so important. And, and you know, there are some Christian traditions that aren't Trinitarian. There's like, there's like oneness, Pentecostalism that, that holds to that is Unitarianism. And I, I think that they have one difficulty with these passages, although they definitely have their own exegetical defenses of how they would read those passages. I find them really difficult. And also I would have to completely rethink all my theology <laughs> if, uh, if, if it was true. Yeah. And so that bothered me a lot because I was like, okay, is the Trinity then primary? And to me, totally, like it's a primary Christian doctrine. Mm-hmm. Like it's creedal, it's in the creeds and stuff. Right. But you know what changed my mind slightly on that? Hmm. I was at a conference, a theology conference uh, called SPS, Society for Pentecostal Studies. And we have Pentecostals from all different denominations from all over the world um, coming to it. And it's really awesome. My favorite conference of the year. Highly recommend it for all those looking for a good academic conference. <laughs> yeah. We'd be worshiping God together it's good together. <laughs> yeah, you don't usually get that all the time but we do there yeah and so there was worship in one of the morning sessions and i remember like one of the sessions was about oneness pentecostalism and i was just like man are they even christians you know like how, how do you how do they think about this stuff <laughs> and um and then as i was worshiping i don't know we were singing something about jesus and i look over and they were all hands raised worshiping too yeah and then that made me think it's like man they affirm jesus is god they affirm the holy spirit they affirm the father is creator. They just view his Trinitarian relationship as modal, but there isn't a rejection of any of what we would consider the persons. Mm-hmm. It made me reconsider it. It's like, it's like there are some formulations, some like of, of non-Trinitarian language yeah. that I think are wrong theologically, <laughs> sure. but may not be heretical. Yeah. And although modalism was deemed heresy for sure, <laughs> I just wonder like, aren't they brothers and sisters in Christ too? Sure. They're worshiping Jesus, you know? And so mm-hmm. like, and this is, this is, it could be a slippery slope, could be difficult, but it gave me a little bit of grace towards this in, in, instead of my stubborn rigidness um, <laughs> when, when it comes to Trinitarian language. But I, I am a big time Trinitarian theologian. I champion it. I, I, I wouldn't even be able to understand my theology without it. Yeah. Um, I, so would you, would you say then, and, and even with that like nuance and stuff, I don't think there's necessarily a denial of a three in one type situation, no. just in a difference in the way they interact, but th- we would say that the Trinity is a foundational Christian I, belief. I, I think it's absolutely true. And it's actually, it's one of the unique claims of Christianity. Like no other religion has anything like Trinity. And the other one is um, the hypostatic union. That's the fact that Jesus is fully God and fully man yeah. at once, hundred percent and hundred percent. Yeah. Those two things deal with hypostases. That's personhood in unique ways that no other religion has dealt. Oh yeah. I had to write a paper about hypostasis in my master's program. And I think my brain almost blew up <laughs> Yeah, and I was like, I don't even remember what I'm writing. <laughs> Everything feels like it's so but different. Those are, the, those are the unique claims of Christianity. Yeah. And that's why that's what makes it special. I think uh, theologically, but also um, why it's a little difficult to talk about. You know what I mean? Yeah. So for sure. So unlike anything else, yeah. <laughs> which is cool. Like, 
how cool is God to be like of all the, you know, the things that people come up with? He is someone who's like, nah, but I, I, this, I'm the only one who can do it like this. And why would we <laughs> expect God to be totally knowable and easily to explain? You know what I'm saying? We should be scared for our lives yeah. if like we can fully understand. I think that's, but oh, that's yeah, why it out. got it, out. it. But I think that's what makes, I don't know. For me, I think I gave up like on, I, the, when I remember being a sophomore and I was in a synoptic gospels class and Josh Ortega was telling me, but like really described like the mystery Mm-hmm. of like of God and like being really settled in the mystery. Cause like as Westerners, like yeah. we love answers mm-hmm. and we want to know things and, and, and we have to understand all the things and why they are the way that they are. And, and everything needs to be kind of black and white. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like, this is one of those things that like from that moment on, like really understanding the mystery of God yeah. and that I'm not going to get it all, yeah. but that's kind of a good thing. Cause right. if I could understand every aspect of God and why he did what he did and, mm-hmm and all the plots and schemes and why he was the way that he was like, he wouldn't really be God because right. then I would have it all figured out. And then I he could do it. Actually be I could do it too. We'd be God. We'd be right. God if we understood it all. Right. And that's what I think is like, okay, like kind of once you settle in the fact that there is just stuff, we're never going to understand this side of heaven. And like, you know, no, you know, you know what? Not just on this side of heaven, <laughs> ever? on that side of heaven too. On all sides. Well, think about it. We're not eternal. Right. And God is. So we're always going to grow and angels are not eternal, right? They? We're always going to grow in our understanding yeah. and in our love and our depth of, of, of who God is. Mm-hmm. It's going to be something that will always happen, yeah. which is actually pretty exciting. It's cool. There's not going to be a time where it's going to be like, ah, I, got I, it. I got it, figured it out. Yeah. It's all good. And so I think with the Trinity, like that's one of those things where it's like mm-hmm. to understand it and to understand what scripture says about it and to be have, to have that theological defense of our yeah. faith but to also be settled in the aspects that are so mysterious right. that make God the eternal, all powerful being that mm-hmm. he is. Yeah. Um, so I think that there's, <laughs> there's room to, to live in both. For sure. For sure. Hold that tension. Hold the certainty of God himself and mm-hmm. his revelation that he has given you. Yes. But understand that this certainty that you have of God is an ineffable eternal God. Yeah. <laughs> and that we won't fully ever grasp. And if we did, we're, we're actually we're in trouble. <laughs> we're grasping some sort of idol that we've created yeah, and not God. For right? sure. So I think one last point I want to make about understanding the Trinity, and it's a really cool one, is this concept of perichoresis. Do you know that term? No. Perichoresis is a Greek term. The concept is related to the word perichoreo, and it was first used by the Cappadocian father, Gregory of Nazianzus. And this was a uh, fourth century. Um, he died around 389. And then John of Damascus, who died in 749, extended this in interpenetration idea. Basically, this is the idea. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit move, interpenetrate, interconnect, interdialogue in each other. Mm-hmm. But do you know what that means? It means that in God's own very essence is community. That's cool. Yeah, God did not need to make anything in order to be communal. Mm. God did not need to make children in order to actually be relational. Yeah. God in himself is relational, is communal. That's great. And so like we get these root word, uh, choreo is kind of a root for like choreography or like (laughs) like dance. (laughs) Yeah. And so one way that people have discussed it, and it wasn't like this when it was originally discussed, but like through the years, it's been kind of understood as like a divine dance. That like the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yeah, they dance around. Mm-hmm. If y'all didn't see, uh, Megan is dancing. I'm right good, now. doing a little. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, there's a divine <laughs> dance <laughs> where the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are engaged in this uh, interrelatedness and this divine dance. And then we could think about like his, in His creation, He has actually extended His hand out to us, so that way we would join Him in the divine dance. Yeah. And I think that's a really beautiful, picturesque way to think about God. Yeah. And to understand him. And so there's some um, common, th- uh, there's some theologians today, Jürgen Moltmann, my dude. Your man, yeah. Miroslav Wolf, <laughs> um, John Zizzo Lewis. Um, there's, there's a good amount of uh, theologians that have used perichoresis as an important talking point. Yeah. So God is relational in his very nature. And so when we start even thinking about how we are made in the image of God, we could even start saying we are relational and we can relate to each other and to God because God is relational in himself. That's actually what Karl Barth has said. That's how he defines the image of God, which is a very interesting, it's an interesting way of thinking about all these things that I think is really, really helpful and very, very like the images that are like powerful. I think these are the kind of things that help me make sense. (laughs) 
yeah. of this kind of stuff yeah where it's like oh it don't this sounds like almost contradictory but it's like it feels very humanizing you know yeah where it's like this helps me understand as a person because i'm always just gonna be a person these aspects of god that make him feel more real personal. and personal to me because i'm like oh that's good like it's not just you're you are the ex- external eternal beyond time and space guy but these kinds of definitions which is why i'm so mm-hmm. thankful for the works of theologians because yeah you ha- you're helping a girl out yeah um if these kinds of like the uh, beliefs that are able to help like maybe um a girly like me or like a, a an average christian believer who's not a scholar like mm-hmm. oh yeah it kind of helps make sense of the mess that sometimes can feel like these theological concepts yeah and i you know we're gonna put in the show notes some great sources that you guys can see to even talk about perichoresis and stuff like that all the but, things <laughs> so like you know why i think what you just said is relatable is because when you say like understanding even these topics make it more make make god more understandable relatable in a way mm-hmm. well because like we're noticing that like in our own own human constitution like the fact that we are relational oh that's actually part of the image of god that's yeah. like that's like god made us this way and it reflects him yeah and so like that i think is is really really powerful it mm-hmm. helps us to understand ourselves not just as these individualistic yeah people by ourselves absolutely you know what i mean like but like people as people right right, right. <laughs> as image bearers yeah. which is different than a lot of western conceptions of self where, oh for you know sure I mean? especially and american conceptions of self show. yeah and so like n- no we're supposed to be in community with each other and that's also like part of the reason why the church is so important yeah is the church super whack in a lot of ways and needs to be reformed yes <laughs> yes we hear that we see that <laughs> but we also have a responsibility to be the church right mm-hmm to be the ones who bring that, uh, that, that loving kindness and goodness, that reforming presence to the church um, that it, it so desperately needs. And if we actually stood up and did that, um, <laughs> you know, we can make the church what it should be, like an image of mm-hmm. the kingdom of God on earth, right? Absolutely. A reflection of it. Megan, what do you think are some good takeaway points, some advice you can give to people who are seeking answers about the Trinity? Speak to your generation my, here. My people. I think if you go in to try and understand every aspect of the Trinity all at once, I think you're just going to get overwhelmed. <laughs> like I think trying to like dive in and be like, here's every single piece of theology ever written on the Trinity. And I need, just need to gobble it all up. And that's yeah. how I'm going to understand it. Right. I think it's okay to go step by step. Mm-hmm. Like, I think it's okay that if to take, whether you take one thing from our show notes or whether there was one piece that we said that you grasped onto mm-hmm. or something that you're curious about, I think that it's, it's okay to start a little bit at a time and yeah. like, let your knowledge of these things grow and expand. Cause we're always learning and we're always, yeah. we're lifelong learners. Like we're always pursuing God. We're always learning to know more. And even if like the theology of it feels really scary, I would encourage you to like be in the word and the parts that, mm-hmm. <laughs> that you see that the Trinity at work that there are moments where you're just like, okay, like all of the external stuff feels really scary. So I'm going to lean into these scriptures that I know are true that I'm seeing these interactions in where Jesus is being baptized and then the Holy spirit and then God, like, and I can grasp onto these things and then go bit by bit. Like no one's asking you to give a a 12 page academic paper defense of the Trinity, (laughs) but just to, 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 know what you know mm-hmm. to and to have your scriptural backings for that i think is a great place to start and you'll always be exploring it anyways like we're we're, we're all always we're exploring always it. learning more and yeah. we're always uncovering a new piece and we're always someone's always writing a new paper or yeah. a book or something about a new aspect of theology that maybe we didn't think of before mm-hmm. so we're never done learning yeah but to have a, a good space to start, I think would just be these scriptural <laughs> places um, where you see the Trinity interacting and not being so caught up in the verbiage of it mm-hmm. where you're like, Oh, I don't understand the Trinity. Where it's like, okay, it's God having grace towards God people Father. too. Yeah. Jesus, Holy spirit. Yes. And not being like, yeah, we got to be gracious. Yeah, Cause it's, it's a difficult concept. And uh, do you know what else I would actually suggest too? So for, five years, I actually was a youth and worship pastor at a Methodist church, the United Methodist church in Florida. And uh, it was a great church and they knew I was Pentecostal coming in. <laughs> they and knew I, what they were signing up for. Yeah, they, they knew it. And, and I told them I would, I would teach the basic Christian beliefs and, and they were totally cool. It was very, it was great. The, you know, the people there are awesome. I yeah. still talk to them on, on social media and the pastor there is great. His, uh, his wife was actually one of my new Testament scholars. She was just fantastic. Yeah, like uh, she was to, fantastic. Yeah, she still is. She's, yeah. she's at Florida Southern. And so like, Oh, one thing that I had to do there is they 
Methodism is a tradition that has confirmation. They do baby baptisms and confirmation. Oh, interesting. Whereas, you know, most free church traditions will do like a baby dedication and then baptism. Yes. But either way, when you're around 12, 13, if you're in confirmation class or if you're baptism class, you typically get like, or you should anyways, like some lessons about the faith. Like, Mm -hmm. like what is the faith? And as you affirm this for yourself before you get baptized or before you get confirmed, do you understand it? Do you, mm-hmm. do you hold it? Yeah. And so I was teaching a confirmation class cause I was the youth pastor part of it. And we were going through um, all the different, you know, doctrines and we got to the Trinity and I got like 12 year olds, 13 year olds in it. Yeah. And one thing I realized is I don't think it's helpful to explain it in a way that is wrong. Mm. I don't think it's, a, it's helpful to talk about the Trinity as an egg or as H2O or something or like as that. Or coffee or yeah, yeah, whatever, yeah, like yeah, a, yeah. A, a chord of three um, notes and stuff <laughs> like that. Like, I don't think any of that is like to say that like, Oh, this is what the Trinity is. And then a few years later, actually it's not, I mean, that's actually heresy. And this is what it is. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I think it's better just to like say it the way it is. And then say, you may not understand this fully and you will understand it more, but like they all, they all understood it. Mm-hmm. And so what I would say is simply give them the formula in this way. The Trinity is God is one in essence. And there's three ways of being God all at once. Mm-hmm. God is God as the father. God is God as the son and God is God as the spirit all at the same time. Yeah. Just saying that a 12 year old grasped it. Yeah. They were able to get it. And then if they don't get it, it's okay because it's mysterious anyways. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But like, but at least they know the language and they don't have to like unlearn that it's not an egg <laughs> later on. Yeah. You know? like, or you know? why it's not an egg. Yeah. You're like, oh crap. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, so that's, that's a piece of advice I would give to those who are trying to instruct others on the Trinity. Yeah. I'll say it one more time just because it's a simple formulation. And it's easy. Um, the Trinity is one. God is one in essence. And there's three ways of being God. God is God, the father, God is God as the son, God is God as the spirit, all at once, co-eternally at the same time. Boom. Boom. Done. Got him. <laughs> all right. Well, <clears throat> you guys were just part of my little intro to Theo type class. I don't teach that <laughs> at LPU. But you know what? You know what does happen at LPU? Hmm. <clears throat> The, the School of Theology and Ministry oh, snap, sponsors perfect. this podcast. Oh man, that was a perfect setup. That was clean, was it yeah, not? you got it, you got so, it. Come on, somebody. <laughs> yeah, so there is an intro to theology class where they do teach this. Mm-hmm. I just happen to not teach that one. But, um, but good people we know do, so yeah. if you ever find yourself wanting one day, to maybe, Megan, come on down. Pull in for that. Speaking life. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so this is a, this is a, hopefully this was a very helpful podcast for you. And hopefully for all of the uh, um, Gen Z millennial folks that are asking or, or even even folks in older generations or whatever that just never quite were able to grasp what the Trinity is, like none of us really can. Hopefully this was <laughs> um, and somewhat illuminating and somewhat yeah. helpful. I think the, the divine dance, the perichoresis is such a beautiful image. And this is a, a way to talk about it that I think can be very theologically um, robust, stimulating. Yes. And really kind of just like, get your theology going. So So we hope this podcast got your theology going. Yeah. (laughs) And you know what? Next week is Easter and uh, good Friday. We're going to have some uh, really, really important stuff to talk about then too. So yeah, we'll leave you in in suspense though. Don't worry about it. Oh snap. All right. See you next time. See you next week.